Okay, well, uh, last week in our introduction and during our time at the Lord's table, I made the argument that God not only ordains that something comes to pass, but also he ordains how it comes to pass. When God saves a Christian by his grace alone, through the finished work of Christ alone, to be received by faith alone, he not only saves them, but he also has ordained how a Christian's salvation will play out in his or her life. All Christians who are genuinely born again, who are truly indwelt by the Spirit, who have legitimately been reconciled to God, and who are uh, his adopted children, they are all new creatures in Christ. They will bear the fruit of repentance. They will live a life of holiness, and they will hold to sound doctrine, or they are not saved. God ordains our salvation, and he also ordains the life that is accompanied with our salvation. They are inseparable. And to think that you can have salvation without the resultant life that uh, comes from salvation, to think you can have one and not the other, is to, in my mind, misunderstand the nature of both and therefore possess neither. So tonight, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at, uh, again, the way that we are saved and the way in which our salvation unfolds in our lifetime. And, and, and we'll consider how the final consummation of our salvation, uh, it's all, all of these things have been ordained by God. And so our salvation, the way our salvation works out in life, and the consummation of our salvation, all of those things are inseparable. And tonight, the text that we're going to look at, it will undo and rock your theology if you have a faulty view of how salvation plays out in the Christian life. Our text tonight is one verse, but it's a very dense verse and we're going to bring a lot of text into the discussion to help us better understand it. And as always, uh, feel free to email me for the notes if you'd like to look up uh, the other text, because I'm warning you ahead of time. There'll, there'll be several. Um, but I have them all in the notes, and I'll be happy to email them to you so you can look over them uh, in the coming weeks. So our text for tonight is 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. And here's what it says. Paul tells Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. That's quite a text. Now Paul just got done in the previous verses commanding Timothy to give his life to an ongoing practice of godliness in his walk that is exemplary for the church. Verse 12 is where we see that. He also commanded Timothy to be a man who is devoted to the word of God, who is given to dwelling upon it, to teaching it, to exhorting others with it, and who immerses himself in the practice of these things as he uses his gifts and the anointing he has from God to build up God's people. That's verses 13 through 15. Now, if Timothy immerses himself in this kind of life, verse 15 promises that all will see his progress in godliness as well as his growth as a minister. So it's out of that flow of thought comes the powerful truths of verse 16. And the commands in verse 16, they're very simple. Timothy's commanded to keep a close watch, it says, on yourself. And when Paul says that, I believe he's referring to the godly example of holiness and love that Paul told Timothy to live into in verse 12. He is to be diligent to watch his life and ensure that the trajectory of it is one of progressive growth in holy love. Timothy is also commanded in our verse to keep a close watch on the teaching. And what, what that speaks to, I believe, is the sound doctrine that he is supposed to instruct the church in. <clears throat> Paul began this chapter, 
chapter 4, by exposing the false teachers who promote a false gospel and lead people astray from the faith through the doctrines of demons. He started this whole chapter exposing those guys in the first five verses. And in chapter, in verse 6, he then transitioned and told Timothy how he is to be. He's not to be like those guys. He is to keep a close watch on his walk and on his doctrine, and specifically the doctrine I think he has in mind is the gospel, because that's exactly what he was refuting in verses 1 through 5, was a false gospel. So, Timothy must watch his teaching very closely and ensure that he doesn't join the false teachers and distort the gospel and lead people away from the faith. So those are the commands of the text. Watch your walk and watch your doctrine. And we're going to spend most of the sermon breaking those two ideas down. But before we do, I want to draw our attention to the result of Timothy. What, what, what's the result in verse 16 of Timothy's diligent, close watch on his walk in doctrine? <clears throat> Paul says that if Timothy diligently watches over the godliness of his own life and the purity of his doctrine, the result will be, he says, by doing this, you will save yourself and your hearers. Now, for most people, that's the statement where the confusion on this verse comes in. Does Paul really mean that Timothy must have a careful, closely watched walk that's diligent to ensure he doesn't let sin rise up, lead him astray, and ruin him, or that he doesn't allow himself somehow to embrace a false gospel? Does he really have to do that in order to be saved? If, he, if, if Timothy doesn't do what Paul says here, um, won't he still be saved? Does the text mean that Timothy can lose his salvation? Is this text teaching salvation by works? A lot of those questions rise up after reading this verse. And at this point, those who love the true gospel, those who rightly know that salvation comes through faith in the gospel alone, and those who rightly know that we can't lose our salvation, with good intentions, if they have an impoverished view of our salvation, with good intentions, contending for those good things, sometimes people with a lack of understanding can start tripping all over themselves trying to explain how this text doesn't really mean what it plainly says. They'll say things about verse 16 like, well, the, you know, that, that text, you know, it's not really talking about salvation. Rather, it's talking about the optimal, though not necessary, uh, Christian life. They'll say things like that. Now, the reason why they say things like this is because they have an impoverished view of what it means to be saved by grace through faith. They think that the demand here to persevere and grow in holy love for the duration of one's life after being saved and the demand here that we must continue to hold to the gospel for the rest of our lives in order to be saved, that somehow that undermines salvation by grace through faith alone or somehow that undermines the eternal security of our salvation. Some people just can't grasp how these things can all coexist. And admittedly, it's a lot to process and think about. So if you find yourself or you're not sure how it fits together, it's okay. There's a lot of stuff here. I'm going to do my best uh, to help you uh, understand that. Now, my personal position that I believe with all of my heart, I would die on this hill. My position is that Paul is telling Timothy here that if he does not persevere in a repentant, holy life of love as he follows Christ, and if he allows himself to fall headlong into sin, he will not be saved on the day of judgment, and he will be found to have been a fraud, and he will be cast into hell. I also believe that the text plainly says here that if Timothy allows himself to be deceived into embracing a false doc, uh, gospel where he somehow adds into it any sort of human performance, uh, this also would result in, eternal, in Timothy's eternal condemnation in hell. This verse is talking about salvation. 
Now, I also believe that in saying these things to Timothy, Paul in no way is teaching salvation by faith plus works, nor is he teaching that we can lose our salvation. I also believe that. I mean, all of those things hold together. And so, if the only verse we had in the Bible was 1 Timothy 4.16, we might conclude that you could lose your salvation. We might conclude that works uh, are, are added to, uh, to our faith. But one of the most important principles of hermeneutics, which is just a big word that means the art and science of interpretation, one of the most important principles of hermeneutics is that no passage in the Bible that is rightly understood will ever contradict another rightly understood passage in the Bible. So what we're going to do tonight is allow the text to say exactly what it says. And then using this hermeneutical principle, which is called the analogy of faith, we will bring in some other scriptures to more deeply inform our understanding of how being saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone, how that is completely compatible with the recipients of that salvation persevering and growing in holiness and love for their entire life, as well as their persevering and holding to the purity of the gospel throughout their lifetime. All of those things are compatible. So we're going to try and put the pieces together from the scriptures. That's all I'm going to argue for. There will be a lot of scriptures. And again, if you want these scriptures, let me know and I will email them to you. You can study it more on your own. So let's begin with this notion. Is Paul teaching a gospel in 1 Timothy 4.16 that demands faith plus works? Is he basically teaching the Galatian heresy? The answer is no. And here is the proof. If we just consider the gospel as Paul has explained it in 1 Timothy, there is no way we will come away with a view that says Paul's gospel is one of faith plus works. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul destroyed legalism. He called it the doctrine of demons. And then just a few verses later in verse 10, Paul said that God is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe, or effectually uh, of those who believe. Or in other words, only those who believe will be saved. Now, it is those who believe the good doctrine of the gospel from chapter 4, verse 6, who will be saved. Paul didn't say those who believe and add their own goodness or ritual or anything else will, uh, will be saved. He said salvation is for those who believe. 1 Timothy 4.10. Now we know also if you back up to 1 Timothy 3.16, you'll remember, uh, I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, The Mystery of Godliness um, but we know from 1 Timothy 3.16 that the truth that leads to the godliness of the Lord's people, it is bound up in deep Christ-centeredness that believes and rejoices in the person and work of Christ. Let's read 3.16. Great indeed we profess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now here, again, I'm not going to re-preach the sermon. You can listen to, uh, to it online if you want more details about it. But here we have this mystery of godliness. How godliness is created in the Lord's people. And the emphasis is clearly Christ-centered. He speaks to the incarnation of Christ, the death and resurrection of Christ, his glorious ascension into heaven. He draws out the heavenly witness to these things, the angels see them, as well as the earthly witness to these things. And the text tells us that the way this glorious gospel that leads to salvation and the godliness of God's people is received is when he is, look at, it, look at the text again, believed on in the world. Faith and faith alone is the only instrument of receiving the gospel. In chapter 2, verse 3 through 7, Paul talks about God's desire for all men to be saved. And he gives the message of how salvation comes in chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Let me read it for you. 
For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. <clears throat> Christ mediates between the one holy God and sinful man who's been separated from God uh, because of our sin. And the way Christ mediates is not by telling the sinners to clean themselves up. Rather, Christ mediates by stepping to the earth and giving himself up as a ransom for them. A ransom is a price that must be paid in order to release captives. And we were captive to sin. And the ransom price that was paid by Christ was his death on the cross, wherein he was punished in our place and paid the price for our sin. And in doing that, Jesus removed that which separated God and man. He paid the price for our sins. And when sinners come to Christ and accept him as their Lord and Savior, the ransom price that Christ paid for them at the cross applies to their sin. And in this way, Jesus mediates between God and man. And as all good mediators do, his mediation results in our reconciliation to God and entering into a right relationship with him. Now, if you read this text, you can see Paul's gospel here. It's not a faith plus works gospel. And how do I know that? If you read verse 7, Paul says that this gospel is received by faith in the truth. So again, he's not teaching works righteousness in this letter. Finally, perhaps the most powerful example of the grace of the gospel that saves through faith in 1 Timothy is found in chapter 1, verse 12 through 17. That's where Paul gives his personal testimony. And in verse 15, Paul says a trustworthy saying is that Christ came to save sinners among whom Paul is chief. And in verse 16, Paul tells us his salvation is from the mercy of God, not Paul's works. His salvation is from the mercy of God and his salvation is a display of Christ's patience and that his conversion is an example of salvation for those, here's what it literally says, who were to believe in him for eternal life. So there it is again. It's faith in Christ apart from works, which is how sinners are saved unto eternal life. So there's many places in 1 Timothy, just right there, where we see Paul's pure gospel. And so 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul's now all of a sudden contradicting himself. <clears throat> so all throughout this letter, Paul's preached a pure gospel that consists of Christ dying for sinners to save them from their sins with sinners receiving this salvation through faith alone. <clears throat> so when someone, when you look at those texts in light of the commandments in 1 Timothy 4.16, for believers, for Timothy, but by extension, all believers to persevere in holiness and love in our lives as a result of being saved by the gospel and to persevere in holding to a true gospel. When we see these things, they're not contradictory. When someone's genuinely saved, they become new in Christ. They now walk with God and it so changes their life that for the remainder of their time on earth after receiving salvation, whether it's a hundred seconds or a hundred years, the essential byproduct of their salvation is that their lives will be characterized by growth in godliness on an ongoing basis as they relentlessly hold to the faith of the gospel. That's how those two things fit together. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to be sinless. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20, he spoke about the believer's good warfare. Wage the good warfare. And our battle to hold to the gospel and to fight sin by what Paul says, maintaining a good conscience. Now when all true believers are genuinely saved, we're not sinless, but our relationship to our sin changes. We no longer sprint into our sin. Rather, we fight the good warfare of seeing our sin, confessing it to God, casting our sin on the cross, and we strive to repent and walk in holiness 
We strive to grow in love, and we strive to increasingly become a faithful example of God's saving power through the gospel. Though there may be occasional rough seasons in the life of a, of a believer, this type of settled hatred for sin and a lifestyle of repentant warfare against it through the cross, it's present as the pattern in a believer's life. Or if it's not there, the professing believer is deceived and is not really a believer at all. So... <clears throat> This is really important for us to understand because there is a massive lie that circulates in Christian circles in our country and the lie is this. It's the lie that believes as long as you did a ritual at one point in your life where you were baptized or you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart, as long as that happened at some point in your life, then you are surely saved even if your life indicates that you couldn't care less about the Lord. That lie circulates all through this country. I don't know about you guys, but I have met many people who believe God is fine with their life of drunkenness, that God's okay with their sexual immorality, that God's okay with their refusal to be part of a church and grow with God's people. They think God is fine with their greed. They think God is fine with their lies, that he's fine with their adultery because the reason God's okay with it is because there was this time back in the past where they got on their knees and they asked Jesus to come into their heart. And because they asked Jesus to come into their heart at some point, even though they live like the devil, they think they're okay with God. And I want to tell you with all of my heart, in love, that is a demonic lie. All real Christians who are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, they will live for Jesus if they've been saved. They will repent of their sins. They will grow in holiness. And if they do not, they are dead hypocrites who are under God's wrath. Where do I get that? I get that from Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Let me read this and let this sober you. This is Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see that? These people are saying, Lord, Lord. They're believers. They believe in Jesus. And not only do they believe in Jesus, but there are things they're doing for Jesus. They're casting out demons in his name. They're not, they're not just doing these for Jesus. These are actually miraculous things that are happening for Jesus. And even though those things are true, what's Jesus say to him? Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. If you just believe in Jesus... And if maybe you've even seen miraculous things from God in your life, but you are a worker of lawlessness, you will hear these words if you don't repent and truly be saved. This is going to be a devastating reality for those who are deceived about what a life that's been saved by the grace of God through the gospel of Jesus really looks like. Furthermore, now the emphasis here is running into sin, unrepentant sin. And Paul says, you have to watch your walk. And Jesus tells you right here, if you don't, this is what it looks like. Furthermore, we saw in 1 Timothy 4.16, if a deliver, a deliver, if a believer departs from the gospel and embraces a theology of salvation that contradicts the gospel, if that believer doesn't repent from his error and return to believing the true gospel, as we see so powerfully in the entire letter to the Galatians or to the, the Hebrews, that person will not be saved either. 
And all throughout 1 Timothy, we see examples of people who either compromise their theology or through a love of sin depart from the faith. And when that happens, Paul doesn't say, well, it's okay, they're still saved. You know how I know that? Because one time after one of the worship services, they prayed with me to receive Jesus, so we know they're okay. Paul does not say that. What does Paul say about specific situations in 1 Timothy? In 1 Timothy 1, 19 through verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, Paul talks about these two uh, guys named Hymenaeus and Alexander. And both of these guys, they stopped fighting the fight against sin. They stopped holding to the sound doctrine of the gospel. They gave up. They gave into it. They gave themselves over to sin. They gave themselves over to false teaching. They wouldn't repent. They deceived themselves. And in so doing, Paul said they had shipwrecked their faith. Their faith is like a sea, or I'm sorry, like a ship at sea caught in a storm and violently thrust upon rocks and completely shattered and ruined. That's what's happened to their faith. And so Paul placed these men in church discipline with the hope that they will repent and be restored. But if they do not, they will be damned. In chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, verses 11 through 12, Paul talks about young single women who are overcome by a desire to be married. And the context tells us it's not the desire to be married that's bad, but it's marriage to an ungodly man. And as these young women marry a man who is ungodly, they are led away from Christ by his godless influence. And when that happens, when they are led away through a godless influence, Paul says they incur condemnation for abandoning their former faith. Here's what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say, well, you know, they, they, they left Christ through the influence of their godless husbands, but because they prayed the prayer, they're going to be okay. He does not say that. He says because they departed from their faith, because they abandoned Christ through this godless influence, they wanted this ungodly man more than they wanted their true husband, Jesus Christ, because of that and the abandoning of the faith, they will be condemned. In chapter 6, verse 10, Paul tells us that through the greedy, lustful, covetous love of money, many in pursuit of riches, they've wandered away from the faith chasing money. The sin of greed led them away from Jesus. And Paul tells them that in 1 Timothy 6.10. And then in verse 11, Paul closes out by exhorting Timothy that Timothy's not to be like that. He's to continue to flee from sin and pursue righteousness. Verse 11. In verse 12 of chapter 6, he tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, holding to the original confession of the gospel that he made. In verses 14 through 15, Paul tells Timothy to persevere in walking in God's commandments until the coming of the Lord. That's the opposite of forsaking your faith. Perhaps you could argue the dominant theme in the entire letter of 1 Timothy is the need to persevere in holding to the gospel and the need to persevere in fighting the good fight of faith as we flee sin and pursue righteousness that we might be found in Christ and saved on that great day. If we depart from the gospel, if we stop fighting sin, if we let it overtake our lives, then we also will join those in 1 Timothy in not being saved. And listen, I don't mean this self-righteously or hatefully at all. I mean this lovingly. But sometimes you've got to say hard things to be loving. The church in America desperately needs to wake up to this reality. So there's the hard-hitting truths of 1 Timothy 4.16. We prayed for refreshment uh, in, in the beginning of the sermon. Way to go. Ah, that, that's real refreshing, isn't it? Well, if you're feeling overwhelmed like that by that, 
Sometimes you can. Let's shift gears now. And this gear we're going to change, it is in harmony with everything we just said. So if it is true that we must continue to fight sin, that we must continue to grow in holiness, that we must continue to hold to the gospel throughout our entire lives in order to be saved, if that's true, and oh how true it is, if I were left to my own power to keep myself repenting, if I were left to my own power to keep persevering in holiness, to keep fighting sin or to keep believing the gospel, if I were left to my own power to do that, I don't know about you, but I would completely despair. I'd be consumed with anxieties. I would be drowned in insecurity. I would be overwhelmed with doubts and my life would sink into hopelessness and sin. If I just live with myself long enough to know that Reg on his own equals disaster. But praise be to God that everywhere in his word, God has revealed that when his grace truly saves someone, he so works in them by the spirit that the power of his mighty hand, he, uh, by, by the power of his mighty hand, he personally will guarantee that he'll cause us to persevere in godly living, to persevere in fighting sin, and to persevere in holding to the sound doctrine of the gospel. So as God's grace first works in us, in some mysterious way, it enables us to continue to press on, even when we're at our weakest moments in our walk in the faith. And I want to show you this wonderful reality from two places. We'll look at one example of it in the Old Testament and one example of it in the theology of Paul. And, and, and as, as a caveat, we're just going to look at two examples, but we could have picked like 40. But we're just going to have two. If you want to know some more, email me and I'll send you the scriptures. And so we're going to look at two examples uh, of this. And then we're going to try and piece everything together and make an application. So uh, for right now, please turn to one of my all-time favorite texts in the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38 through 41. I've mentioned this text a bunch of times uh, from the pulpit. I will do it a bunch more times in my life, Lord willing, because it is awesome. And so... Jeremiah 32, verse 38 through 41. Let's see in the, if in this text we can see how God's saving grace enables our perseverance in salvation. And let's start by reading verse 38. So, uh, if, uh, for those of you who are not sure where it is, it's after uh, Isaiah uh, in, in the Old Testament. It, it's after the book of Isaiah and uh, it's before Lamentations. Let's read verse 38. Uh, uh, chapter 32 of Jeremiah, verse 38, we'll start with. <clears throat> this is God speaking, and God says, And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. So there's the first thing we see in Jeremiah 32, 38, is we see God promises that he will be the God of his people, and that his people will have him as their God. And because of this wonderful reality, the reality of our belonging to God and him belonging to us, all of the remaining blessings that we will see in verses 39 through 41, they are all possible because of verse 38. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now let's look down at verse 39 and, and look at the wonderful promise here. God says this about his people. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. Listen to that. Coming from Almighty God himself is the promise that he in fact will give to his people one heart and one way that will cause them to fear him forever for their own good. God's grace will create a heart that has the one singular purpose and one lay, way of life of consistently living in the fear of the Lord for their own good. What a promise. When we are born, no matter how cute we might be at baby, as babies, we are not good. We are sinful. We have deceitful, wicked, rebellious, fickle hearts. Jeremiah says that. The heart is deceitful above all things. He, the unregenerate heart 
And it, it's still, in some ways, even after we've been saved, our hearts can still deceive us. Our hearts are not good on their own. But God, when he saves his people, he does give us a new heart. And by his divine, divine power, this new heart we see in verse 31, it will persevere in walking in the fear of the Lord. Undergirding the personal decisions each believer makes to fear God is this promise that God will make sure it happens. Undergirding our personal decisions to walk in the fear of the Lord, there's an impulse or a will or an ability to do so within us, and that will and ability to do so, it springs forth from the new heart God supernaturally creates in us. God promises to do this, to cause us, to give us this heart, this heart that's committed to walking in the way of fearing the Lord forever. He promises to do this for our good, the text says in verse 39. What, what is the good? The answer is more unpacked for us in verse 40. But before God gives the answer to that question, God elaborates a little bit more uh, on his own pledge to do this for his people. Look at verse 40. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. You see that? God binds himself to an everlasting covenant. What covenant is that? I believe it's the new covenant. You just got done talking about it in chapter 31. He binds himself to a promise and covenants that he will not turn away from doing good to his people. God will persevere in doing good to us. He won't stop ever doing good to his people. And the result of that pledge on God's part is that the specific good he has in mind, it will come to pass in us as a permanent reality in our lives. So what is the specific good? Look at the last statement of verse 40. He says, And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. That is a precious, precious promise. God will cause us not to turn from him. Because with the new hearts that we have that he gives us, they will fear God. They will fear the misery and ruin of living a life that doesn't walk with the Lord. They will fear the needless hardships and heartbreaking realities people who do not fear God inflict upon themselves. They will fear the eternal condemnation associated with turning from the living God. And so, because of this divinely created fear of the Lord within them that is there through the new heart God sovereignly bestows upon his people, because of that, they will not turn from God. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Or, to put it another way, they will persevere in following him. They will watch their walks closely. They will do 1 Timothy 4.16. So when hopelessness and despair set in because of difficult trials and hardships, God's genuine, real, born-again people, guess what? We'll be tempted. Real believers will wrestle with their beliefs. Real believers will cry real tears. They will feel real sadness. Their hearts will really be heavy. Their minds will genuinely be confused. They will ask hard questions. They'll feel real pain. And their struggle will be strong. But as all of the heartache is being sorted out, as all of the confusion is being waded through, as all of the pain is piercing them, when they feel like their faith hangs by a string, there will be, undergirding all of this difficulty, the sovereign hand of God who is keeping them. And though he is allowing them to be rattled, though he is allowing them to wrestle, though he is allowing them to struggle with doubts, he will see to it that they do not leave the faith because he will cause them to hold on. In the tears, in the heartache, in the confusion, when the temptations 
uh, to, to leave the faith or to give up and sin binge set in, there will be something that prevents God's people from finally and ultimately shipwrecking their faith. Though we may stumble, though we may fall, though we may sin, there, there, there will be some truth, some impulse, some power within God's people that barely flickers. But it will flicker strong enough to keep God's people from turning from him. Because this little tiny impulse in them that barely flickers and urges them to follow the Lord, it's the flickering light of hope from a sovereign God who is, whose power is causing them to hold on to him even if they feel they can barely do so. When God says he'll keep us from turning from him, experientially, doesn't always look like what we might think. You hear that promise, you might be like, oh, yeah, man. every day I'm just going to be like, yeah, follow the Lord. But it's not what it looks like all the time. Sometimes you're crushed to the absolute uttermost, and you are barely hanging on. But that barely that you have to hang on with, that's God's barely. And that's God's power. And it doesn't mean you're fake if you get brought to that point. God preserves the faith of his people and keeps them from turning. Though his people may have sinned, there's enough reminder of the cross within them to sustain just enough hope to return to God and be cleansed again and keep going. Though their heads are spinning and they feel like God is mad at them because their trials are overwhelming, there's enough faith in this good God to cause them to press on and not abandon the Lord. The deepest cause for our perseverance is God himself. Yes, as believers, we make real human choices not to give up. We make a real choice and decision not to abandon God. We make real choices not to embrace a false gospel. We literally make a choice not to run headlong into sin. We choose not to stop fighting for holiness and not to forsake Jesus. But... Undergirding and enabling those real human choices is the grace of God causing them to persevere in that. These two realities, they're real, they're powerful, and they're sufficient, and it's happening in your life even if you can't perceive it. That is such a precious blessing. You see why I love that text? Now, verse 41 is the glorious icing on the divine cake of the enablement of grace when it tells us that not only has God promised to cause us to not turn from him, not only are we in covenant with him wherein he guarantees his grace towards us, but guess what? He is pumped about doing all this. Verse 41. Here's how God emotionally feels about this. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Where's God when you're tempted to turn and forsake him? Where's God when you're so confused you feel like you don't know anything? Where's God when you've sinned and you're choking on the guilt of it? He's not only inviting you to turn to him to be cleansed, he's not only demanding that you persevere in following him, but also with all of his soul and with all of the joy his infinite and divine being is capable of, which how much do you think that is? He is enabling your perseverance. He's enabling your turning to him to be cleansed one more time. He is enabling your ability to keep fighting the good fight. So, if those truths are present, if that's what God does to us, then it might ask the question, well, if God's doing that, God's keeping us, why did Paul write 1 Timothy 4.16? Why say, take heed to your walk and your doctrine by doing so you'll save yourself and yours? Why say that? God works, God's power is at work. Why does Timothy need to even hear that? Isn't it just going to happen? That's a question that could rise out of it. How would you answer that? Here's my answer. When God dispenses this power to keep you following him, to keep you repenting of your sin, to keep you coming to Christ, to keep you holding to the word, he doesn't just go, he doesn't just kind of do it in a vacuum where 
He, he uses something to dispense this power through. Where do you think the power for you to persevere comes from? The word of God. Timothy might be tempted to quit, but as he reads the exhortation to persevere and, uh, and, and, and to keep following him in holiness and keep holding to the gospel, as he reads that exhortation, as he reads the warnings, as he reads the promises, God, by his divine power, takes those things and creates in Timothy the strength and power and ability to persevere in the faith. He does it through his word. In the first creation, how did God create all things? The Lord said, right? By his word. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells, tells us that Jesus created all things. But not only did he create all things, but what else does he do? Creates them and he sustains them. Hebrews 1 3. This whole creation continues to exist because Jesus, by his word, is sustaining it. He is sustaining the pews, the lights, the ground, the trees, everything that exists. His word keeps it. Now, if Christ is doing that in the first creation, what do you think he does in the new creation? When believers are in, become Christians, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us we are a new creation. We're new creatures in Christ. How do we become believers? By the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You become a new creation by the word of God. Just as the first creation emerged by the word of God, so also the new creation emerges by the word of God. And in Hebrews 1, 3, we know the first creation is sustained by the word of Christ's power. Well, how do you think the new creation is sustained? How's your faith sustained? How is your walk sustained? By the word of his power, just as it is in the first creation. So God gives this grace to keep us and cause us from turning from him. And he dispenses it through his word. So that's the Old Testament. I want to close now in showing you uh, this same reality in the New Testament. So please turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. We'll consider this and then we'll close out and make application. Paul wrote to Titus. Titus is a young pastor like Timothy. And Paul gives Titus pretty much the same exact, he uses new covenant verbiage, uh, but he gives essentially this, he teaches essentially Jeremiah 32 to Titus in Titus 2, verse 11 through 15. So this text teaches us, go ahead and turn there, Titus 2. This text teaches us what the grace of God does to believers. This is a very important text because many American Christians totally misunderstand the grace of God. And here's a very instructive text. Let's look at verse 11 and see what the grace of God does. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. All people meaning it's available to all people and it's only those who believe that are saved. But the grace of God, and it's God's grace alone, it brings salvation. Right? That is simple. That is clear. Now, 100% of the time, when God's grace brings salvation, it also brings that which is found in verse 12. What's in verse 12? Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. What's training us to renounce ungodliness and living godly lives in the present age? What is it? Follow the flow of thought. God's grace brings salvation. Training us. What's training us? God's grace. God's grace not only saves, but it also transforms us. It also delivers us from sin, and it also teaches us to pursue godliness. God's grace does that. Now, whenever you insist on someone's repentance, or when you urge them to grow in godliness, a common objection that American Christians give is, that's not grace. Well, how does that square with this text? That is exactly what grace is. Grace saves you and grace 
pulls you away from sin and trains you to be godly. That is the truth of what the Bible says grace is. It's not the American perversion of it. Grace changes you. It not only saves you, it transforms you and delivers you from sin and conforms you to godliness. Now listen, that is the exact same idea as God pledging in Jeremiah to give us hearts that cause us to fear him and not turn from him. That's the same idea. It's just worded differently. Can you earn grace? Of course not. It's a gift that comes from God. In Jeremiah 32, God sovereignly keeps us by his power. In Titus 2, it's God's grace that sovereignly he disposes according to his good purpose that saves us and changes us. God is the author of both. It's just worded differently, but it's the exact same theological reality. When God's grace savingly works in a believer, it always trains them to repent of their sin and live a godly life. Godly life. Now, some believers grow in that more than others. But it is true in significant measure for every real Christian. And how long? How long will we persevere in godliness and the grace of God? How do we know from the text? Verse 12 tells us. Look at the end of verse 12. It says that we do, that, that God's saving grace changes us. Look, we do this in this age. And then verse 13 tells us that the grace of God continues to work in God's people until what? It, it works in us while we are, look at verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope. What's that? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you see the time element there? The time in which believers are to persevere in renouncing sin and, per and pursuing godliness because they've been saved by grace, it's the time between this present age spoken of at the end of verse 12 and the return of Christ spoken of in verse 13. Or their death if they die before Jesus comes back. But do you see the parallel to 1 Timothy 4.16? Watch your walk, watch your doctrine. By doing this, you'll save yourself and your hearers. Here's this other thing. God's grace brings salvation to all, and it teaches you to flee sin and conform to godliness in this present age while you wait for the coming of the Lord. Those are the same exact ideas. They're just worded differently. Paul's ex more explanatory uh, in, in Titus 2. You must persevere in holiness in fighting sin or you will not be saved. But by the grace of God and by the promise of God, you will persevere in holiness and you will persevere in the fight against sin. And not only will you persevere in holiness, not only will you persevere in holding to the, uh, uh, or, or persevere in, in, in fighting sin, we see that in Titus 2, you'll renounce ungodliness and live a godly life, but also those who've truly been saved, you'll persevere in holding to the true gospel. Where do I get that from Titus 2? Look at verse, verse 14, which speaking of Christ, it says that Christ is the one who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. So there it is again. Christ died on the cross for his people to redeem and purify us from sin and make us his own possession. Now remember Jeremiah 32? Remember how it started in verse 38? What did it say? God said he would be the God of his people and, uh, and that uh, uh, he said, I will be their God and they will be my people, right? We belong to each other. Now look here at Titus 2, right? He, uh, Jesus died, what does it say? To redeem us from all lawlessness and purify himself a people for his own possession. He possesses us. It's the same exact idea of Jeremiah 32, 38. So here in Titus 2.14, we see what, it, what, what Jeremiah 32.38 looks like in light of Christ inaugurating the new covenant. Christ died for us. He redeemed us for our sins, and he purified us so that we will belong to him. Now, this salvation in Titus 2, it, it's a salvation that's clearly Christ-centered. We saw that in verses uh, 13 and 14, right? He gave himself 
for us. And it's also a salvation that verse 11 of Titus 2 tells us is all of grace. See the pure gospel there? It's Christ and it's grace. Now, having said that, the grace of God teaches us to fight sin, teaches us to pursue holiness, or uh, uh, as the end of verse 14 puts it, those who have been redeemed and purified by the cross of Christ to belong to him, they're also those who, look at the end of verse 14, what, are, what else are they? Those who are zealous for good works. God's true salvation in the gospel is one that makes us new creatures. It's one that gives us new life. It's one that is transformative as we walk in him and live by his grace. It is one that bears the consistent fruit of fighting sin and holy living. It is one that causes us to love the gospel more and more as we grow in him. And if we've been saved by God in Christ... We have to persevere in these things until we die or until the Lord returns, whichever comes first. We must persevere if we are to be heirs of eternal life. And at the same time, if we've been saved by God in Christ, he will sovereignly see to it that no matter what temptations come our way, no matter what mistakes we make, no matter how we might fall into sin, if we are truly his, we will persevere to the end. We will constantly return to the cross and be renewed. We will be saved because of the wonderful yet mysterious partnership that exists between God's sovereign enabling grace and our willful decisions to choose to follow him in holiness and perseverance in the gospel. So a life lived off of such a gracious, loving, powerful God that displays the true saving realities of the gospel. Not only will that life itself be saved, but what, did, what was the other promise in 1 Timothy 4.16? That if he perseveres and watches his walk closely and his doctrine by doing so, you will save yourself and who else? Your hearers. Or another way to put that, those who are in your life. Do you want to see other people saved in your life? Here is God's divinely inspired evangelistic program. It's not a fog machine. It's not a coffee bar. It's not church frisbees with their logo on it. It's not being cool. It's not anything else. Here is God's prescription to not only see yourself be saved, but save others. Be a holy person and hold to the gospel. That's it. Those around you, when you walk in that, they will see the power of God and the reality of God in your life. They will see the power of the gospel as you live it and explain it. They will see it in your life. And in due time, though you may have to be patient, God will open their eyes to his glory through the holy gospel-driven life of his people and others will be saved as well. That's it. That isn't fancy. That isn't full of human schemes. It's just the power of God unto salvation. So here's how we're going to close out this application here. If you're playing with sin right now, if you're lukewarm towards God, I want to plead with you to wake up. Your soul is at stake. Your life is not a game. You are an eternal being who will spend eternity in heaven or hell. Listen, God doesn't care if you prayed to receive Jesus 10 years ago. That, that, that's not what you should be asking yourself as you look at your walk. You should be asking yourself, are you walking in his grace now? Are you holding to the gospel now? Are you fighting sin now? Are you fleeing wickedness now? That's what you have to focus on, not some ritual you did when you were eight. If you turn to him, he will cleanse you, restore you, and keep you. But if you do not, you will only meet his fierce wrath in hell forever. So please, stop playing with sin. Stop playing with your life. Stop playing with eternity because I promise you on the authority of God's word, God is not playing with these things. And then for real believers who are in tough seasons, I know you might be confused in this season. You might be discouraged. 
You might have absolutely no perception of God's presence in your life at all. Your head might be spinning with all that you're going through right now, but know this. If you continue to follow him and cling to the gospel, God has not left you and he will not leave you. He has pledged to be with us. He has pledged to keep you following him even when you have no answers. He's pledged to continually forgive us if we bring our sins to him. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. I write this to you so that you do not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who's the propitiation for our sins. God hasn't left you. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't forsaken you. Even if you can't tell it right now, he is shepherding you and he is watching you closely. His eye is fixed upon your soul. He has pledged himself in covenant promise to do nothing but good to you. And sometimes the dark seasons are what is best for your soul. So look at the cross. There is great mercy there. His forgiveness is always with us if we hold to the cross in faith and if we follow him and continue in his grace. And in your dark night, we have the promise and hope that the dawn of God's light, it will soon break in. The unpleasant season, if you cling to Christ and his gospel and you flee sin, the unpleasant season will pass. God will restore you. God will change you. God will forgive you. God will teach you. God will lead you. God will love you. God will do good to you. And God will do it with great joy. Only don't forsake him lest you perish in unbelief. So for struggling believer, here's some promises I'm going to read over you as I dismiss you. Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.13 Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who is at work in you both to will and to act according to your good, his good pleasure. That sounded all like Jeremiah 32. It sounds exactly like it. And I close with this benediction to you and hope that it will give you encouragement in our God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So, questions? Comments, feel free to ask. I know it's a lot of material and there are a lot of questions surrounding this kind of stuff and I don't want you to be confused because this is super essential for your walk and your salvation. So if you have the question, probably someone else has it. Uh, it's okay, uh, go ahead and ask or if you have a comment uh, to make, uh, do that as well. So anybody? Email me or call me if uh, you uh, think of one uh, later. So I love you guys. And let's hold to this and take this as deadly serious as anything in our life. The consequences are horrible for not doing so. And the consequences are amazing for doing so. There's no like middle ground with this. So there's it's awesome or horrible depending on what you do with it. So, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you and we give you thanks for your grace towards us in the gospel. We give you thanks for sending your son to die for our sins. We give you thanks for changing us and making us new creatures in Christ. We give you thanks for your divine pledge to keep us following you by your sovereign grace. We give you thanks for the commandment that we do it, Lord. We just, we thank you for all of it. And God, we don't, we're never going to know how everything works together, but just the, the little bit you allow us to see, God, is wonderful, and we praise you for it. And so I just pray for each one of us, Lord, that you will just bless us. God, that you will fulfill Jeremiah 32 in a special way. Lord, if someone has sinned in this room, I pray you'd give them the grace to just turn to you and confess it and be forgiven and continue to follow you. If someone's playing with sin in this room, God, I pray you would cause their heart to be alarmed and terrified 
and, and, and walk in the fear of the Lord and flee from it, Lord. And if we're just enjoying a good season, God, I pray that would continue. Wherever we're at, you know your people. You know the hairs on our head. Shepherd us according to our need. God, build us up in the love and grace of God according to your word and the power of your gospel. Keep us, Lord. Keep us. And help us to keep ourselves in the love of God, as Jude says. Lord, we know both of these things are a reality. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.